Okay, we mix. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me or the voices in my head like singing two songs at once, but you never know. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in this head of mine. Well, the remix was actually Jody Littman. Um, loved playing her music before the show. I made it over, I made it through, and that is definitely something that survivors of sexual and domestic abuse can say. Hello! Hey, it's your favorite girl, Chris Styles, and we are back for another, another healthy conversation. And we are back for another edition of Cassie Live, brought to you by way of Praise TV. So I'm so glad to be back. I cannot believe it's been like, what, three months? We only see each other every three months. That's got to change. Something's got to give. We've got to do something about that. But I'm glad you can make it back. So I've got a great lineup for you today. Um, and we're doing a, a throwback of guests of sorts. But first, before we go too far, I believe we need to usher in the spirit of the Lord. Because without him, we are nothing. But with him, we can do all things. So we should probably ask him to be here. Pray with me. Yes. Lord, thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to sit here on the couch, Heavenly Father, with someone who has gone through trials and tribulations, but you have brought her through. I just thank you for that. I thank you for an opportunity to be able to broadcast to all of those who are watching, dear Lord, in, in hopes that something that we say will move them, encourage them, so they can move into a life after abuse, so that they can begin to share, heal, and live. I just thank you, dear Lord, and ask that you give me the appropriate words to say, to speak, um, and that they may cause healing and excited about our guests. Dear Lord, just thank you for giving them safe travels, that they are able to be here and to minister to your people. In your name, we praise you and we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 All righty, dighty then. All right, so what do we have going on this month? We've had a lot of things happening in um, our absence, I guess you can say. We have done our healing session, um, which is a survivor session, and we've also been at several different events sharing with other survivors about sharing healing and living and moving into a healthy life after abuse. We launched a new website. We're moving into a new office soon. So we're like totally geeked. Um, so I just want to let you know some of the things. And if you ever want to know what's going on with the Cassie Project, www.thecassieproject.org. That's uh, thecassieproject.org. So how about we introduce my first guest? All right, so this young lady, Oh my gosh, and I want, I, I want you to see her before I go into everything, everything that we've, we've done together. But this young lady is no stranger to the couch. She's a, she's a newbie to the actual uh, sectional, but she's no stranger to the couch or the Cassie Project. So I'm, I'm very, very um, excited to have her back. So if you could, please, you know, I know you can't, I can't hear you, but put your hands together for Lorraine. <laughs> Barry, you have to say it like that. It's Lorraine Hooberry. She is the founder of the Stacy Foundation, and she's had a lot of amazing things happening too. But welcome back to the couch, Lorraine Hooberry. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good. Oh my gosh, you haven't been here in what are we almost five years? That's, yeah, about. Gee, Willikers. Lorraine was here for the second edition of Cassie Live. And um, she has an organization called the Stacy Foundation. What's the acronym for that? Striving to Achieve Compassion, Intervention, and Education. Striving to Achieve Compassion, Compassion. Intervention. In Intervention, and Education. And Education. <laughs> That's what I said. No, um, Stacy, the Stacy Foundation has been around for a while, and it was actually launched in honor of her daughter, Stacy. Um, much like the Cassie Project is for Cassie, who is not my daughter. She was one of my BFFs, but um, just the same. We launched these projects out of love and an effort to help other people. So, Lorraine, let's, let's start with the Stacy Foundation. You had to launch the Stacy Foundation, and its, it's acronym is what it is because there was no compassion in your journey. Um, is that right? Correct. Okay, all right. But before we go any further, I know I, I went from here to there, but I forgot I wanted to share something with you. So I'm gonna, I, I wanna give you a teaser a little bit about some of the things that we've, we've done together that sure. you've been around for. Um, so if you are ready, Mr. Producer Man, I'd love to throw it to video. 
um, to show Lorraine a little bit of the things that uh, might trigger some things in a good way about our past together and our journey with the Cassie Project. Um, okay, yeah, I love that. Don't you love that? You all don't know <laughs> what that means. It's like a little crazy. No, I wouldn't say that. But Lorraine has been, um, she was one of the driving forces behind the Cassie Project, behind launching the Cassie Project. We met in 2011 I believe so. on another show that I host called In Focus, and that is for the city of Cincinnati. So it sounds like we're about ready to go. So I'll finish that story when we come back. All right, check this out. <laughs> Goodness gracious. And you know the objective is to provide sharing, healing, and living for survivors of sexual and domestic abuse. Oh, and I didn't think I'd live to be 25. Now I am a um, survivor of domestic violence. Okay. It's me. All right. Same here. Right. Domestic violence. <laughs> survivor of domestic abuse. One night I woke up in the middle of the night and uh, the gun was, a shotgun was pointed against the, my temple and he pulled the trigger. So I believe that your God allowed me to survive and to be a, a survivor so that I could tell the story so that others who are going through that process can know that they too can make it. My <laughs> second husband um, used sex um, as punishment as well. Uh, it was actually when I was in middle school, my best friend raped me. I had to revisit that very moment of when I got molested and that was the hardest thing for me to do because it was by a family member. My own mother uh, believed that anybody who was beaten deserved it so, and said so to me so I know I, I could get no help from her. Uh, I actually didn't tell anybody about it, I just kept the bottle in. I, you know, I had to go through some counseling and some emotional truths mm -hmm. to find out who I really was and to take steps to fix it. some of the people that we've talked to. Lorraine, does any of that remind you of anything? Yeah, all of it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Do you remember when we went to Xenia and um, I can't remember his name, but the guy was so tall um, that he had to actually pick up the couch to sign it. <laughs> that he, yeah, he couldn't bend over to sign the couch. And he was a reformed abuser. So he was the first reformed abuser that we talked to. <clears throat> so that video was just just a, a glimpse into some of the survivors that we've had an opportunity to speak with who've come to the couch to share so they can start healing and living and moving into life after abuse. So, back to our connection. All right, so um, 2011, Lorraine and I met on In Focus, and I was all excited about what she was doing, and I was like, I've been wanting to do something for my girlfriend for years. At that point, it had been over 10 years. And I said, can we talk? And she said, yeah, we never talked. Um, I don't know what happened, an entire year went by, um, and then some other things happened with me, but then the, the, the next August rolled around and, and I was um, offered an opportunity to do something, so I decided to launch the project. At which point I called Cassandra's mom and said, or I called, Cass, I called Barbara Ann, or did you tell me to call Barbara Ann? I don't remember, it's okay. been so long. I think I called Barbara Ann, and Barbara Ann was like, you know, you should talk to Lorraine who? No, she said Hooberry. She said, you should talk to Lorraine Hooberry. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I know Lorraine Hooberry. Okay, you know, we met, she's, she's done my other show and I've got her information. And so that's when I reached out to Lorraine and said, hey, I wanna do this for Cassie. Can you help me? She said, yes, and the rest is history. You know what I was watching yesterday? What? The video from when you took me to the prison for the first time. Really? Do you remember that day? Vaguely. Well, I have you on videotape, so I'll have to show it to you. But yeah, that was the day we went up to the prison. We went up to, was it Lorraine? It wasn't the one that was way far away. Can you remember London? which prison it was? Lebanon? L London? Did you say London? London. London. It may have been where the guy, we were, you, um, you let me talk about Cassie, and the guy was saying that he knew Tony, and that Tony was, you know, a good guy, and blah, blah, blah. And like, this is the guy that killed my girlfriend. He's a good guy? Yeah. Really? Oh, he gets to prison and he's a good guy? You remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah, and the warden had to come because um, it was getting heated between me and that particular individual. Yeah. So we've had some journeys, but we've had some good times. <laughs> we have. We've had some good times. So let's talk about Lorraine Hooberry and the Stacy Foundation. So tell me, tell me why you started the Stacy Foundation. Well, I started the foundation in honor of my daughter Stacy, who, along with her sister, was assaulted in our home by a stalker in 1999. And after losing Stacy and Christy surviving, 
I needed to find an outlet to do something positive to get through the negative. Um, and the only way that I could do that was to pour back into the community that reached out to us in such an amazing way. Mm -hmm. So that was the start of the Stacy Foundation. So the community was helpful. Oh, absolutely. Okay, they so they rallied around us. So the acronym Stacy, speaking of the compassion, who didn't show very much compassion? The ju uh, the courts, <laughs> the um, offender, his family. Um, you had an issue with the with the I guess the attending officers. I don't know if that's what you call them or not. The ones, with, you know, just really a lack of sensitivity. Yes. Um, um, about the part where they didn't even want to let you um, on your own street or in your own home. Yeah. After everything happened. We were interrogated for two hours, um, treated like we didn't really matter, like we weren't a part of all of that. I didn't ask for this. Right. And yet here I am dealt a life sentence. I had to learn how to figure it out. I had to figure out how to deal with this and how to get through moment by moment by moment why my 14-year-old daughter Christy's in a hospital fighting for her life, not expected to live. So the law enforcement was not very friendly at first. Okay, I, I, I don't even know which way, because I know your story, mm -hmm. and I know your journey, and it's like, I don't wanna give the book away, but this is a very thick book. So I'm pretty sure we're not gonna touch on all of this during the show, mm -hmm. but um, I just, there, there were key points to your story that just stick with me, um, especially about how he, you know, waited for you all to come home because the intention was to kill the whole family. Right. So I don't want to tell the story. I want you to tell the story, <laughs> Lorraine. That's why I brought you. Tell okay. me. Tell me the story. So how did it work? Well, I mean, well, not how did it work, but how did it go? Right. Stacy arrived home that day on January 29th, 1999, after getting out of school early and found him waiting at the house for her. This young man was 20 years old. He was a transient. He was always in trouble. And he was infatuated with Stacy and wanted to date her, and she'd rejected him. So he took that as, if I can't have you, nobody can. And so we, they fought in the driveway. She walked in the house to get away from him, to get ready for work, and didn't lock the door like I told her to do when you're home alone. Oh, wow. He slipped in five minutes later, found her in the basement doing laundry, tried to attack her three different times, and he had the, the cordless phone in his back pocket so she couldn't call for help. And he finally pulled a knife and stabbed her because she kept fighting him and she collapsed across the hall into her sister's bedroom floor where she bled to death while he stomped on her throat to make sure she died. Oh my gosh. He then waited for more than two hours for my younger daughter Christy to come home and she found her sister dead. He forced her to the basement where he sexually assaulted her, strangled her with her shoestrings, cut both of her wrists, stabbed her twice in the stomach and tied her up and threw three bicycles on top of her nude bound body and left the house by taxi. By taxi? By taxi. Was he not bloody? Was he? I'm, 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 this is this is just something I'm thinking. You 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 kill someone and then you attack someone else, and you get in a taxi and the cab driver's not curious or I don't know maybe he changed clothes. I don't know. Yeah, the just, article of clothing he had on didn't show the blood, but there was blood on him. It was splatter. Oh my gosh. So after this, where were you when this happened? You at were at work. work? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you got the call, what what happened when you got the call? When I got the call, it was an officer telling me, asking me when I need, when can I come home? And I said, what do you mean, when can I come home? What's wrong? And he says, well, we just need you to come home. And he kept repeating the same thing over and over again, and I kept asking questions, and he just kept saying, we just need you to come home. You need to tell me why. He finally tells me, in a very nonchalant way, that we have one of your daughters, and we just need you to come home. You have one of my daughters. Which one do you have? I don't have a name. You're a police officer, and you don't have a name? Mm -hmm. Right. Something's wrong with this picture. So I finally got agitated and just left the office. And on the drive home, what I didn't know was it was all over the media that two, do two girls in Yorkshire had been sexually assaulted and both were dead. But I wasn't listening to the news. I was going over the conversation in my mind or lack of with this police officer and trying to figure out why he was calling me and not giving me any information. And then I arrived home to a crime scene and was forced into a neighbor's house by police officers interrogated for two hours. This, had you been in the house yet? No, they never got to the house. The roadblock was at the end of the, the road and I couldn't, there was nowhere to go. The street was jam packed with police officers and fire trucks, ambulances, just cars everywhere. It looked like a scene out of a movie. And I couldn't go anywhere but at the roadblock, so. So you found out, when did you find out, you know, about your daughters? Because 
um, well, you said you weren't listening to the newscast, but no. they said they had one of your daughters. When did you find out which was which and what was happening? It was about an hour after I arrived home, or t at the neighbor's home, I was told by my fiance, Bobby, who found the girls, um, that Stacy was gone, and I immediately went into mother mode, gone where with who, why didn't you call and tell me she, were le she was yes. leaving, this isn't right, she knows, she's, she knows the rules, yada, 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 and finally he looks at me, and what I didn't realize at the time is he was in complete shock. And so he was going in and out of basically consciousness, and he finally looks at me and he says, Stacy's been murdered. So I'm standing in a room full of 40 police officers, and it's my fiance who tells me what's happened. And then they just tell me, the officer comes up and says, we're trying to get you to the hospital. And I'm thinking, Bobby's injured, never thinking it could be Christy. And, and still, it, it didn't even sink in that, that Stacy was, was gone, that she had been murdered. It just wasn't, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. I understand. It doesn't happen to us, you know? Yeah, Who you would only, do this to us? You only, you only read about it. Right. And it never happens to, to you or anyone you know. Right. So we think. So you get to the hospital, you finally get to the hospital. There was a little resistance there too. They oh weren't goodness. very user friendly, I guess you can no. say. What was your experience like at the hospital? Well, when we got to the hospital, I expected to be taken to the front door. We were taken to the back parking lot. We parked as far away from the building as they could possibly get. An officer and a chaplain. What was that all about? I, the media. They didn't want us oh, uh, right. interceding the media right, or the right. media interceding us. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they took us to the back. We finally got to the back of the building and walked into a, a long hallway, which at that point was in such severe shock that the hallway was barely wide enough for me to walk down, but a million miles long. And I kept thinking, there's got to be somebody that can help us. I finally see a nurse, and I and went directly toward her, and I said, excuse me, ma'am, my daughter was brought in by, and that was all I got out. She blew past me, never made eye contact, <sighs> never said a word, never slowed down. It was just as if I was invisible, and I began to feel that way. We finally got to um, the common area, and there was a desk with a, a lady behind the desk, and I went up, and I said, after standing in line for what seemed like forever, I explained to her why I was there. She said, honey, you're in the wrong line. You need to be over there. This is a doctor's office waiting area. And I'm, wow, amazing. Are you kidding me? So I go to the next reception desk, and it's a young girl. It's a Friday night. She doesn't want to be there on a Friday night, and she's got an attitude 10 miles long, and so do I, and we clashed. And she told me that there was nobody by the name of Christy Reed admitted. <laughs> okay, what do I do now? Well, there's nobody there to help me. The police officer and the chaplain's gone. I have no idea who to ask. So I just spelled her name and I said, can you please look again? And she said, we ain't got nobody by that name. That was the last straw. <coughs> I, I leaned over and I said, get, get me a manager now. So a lady comes over and she said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but we're in the middle of a shift change. We're trying to get you a social worker. Can you have a seat for half an hour until we get that worked out? What? I'm in one of the 100 top trauma centers in the United States, and they can't find my daughter, and they can't help me. So had they, had they brought her in under an alias, maybe? They did, and we found out later when okay. the social worker finally got to me. She said, we're take, I'm taking you to your daughter. And I said, now we're in the elevator. And she said, I said, is she here? And she said, yes, she's here. And I said, why isn't she listed? And she says, well, she's under an assumed name. An assumed name? What name? And she said, Jane Doe. Well, in my mind, that means she's dead and you can't identify her. And I started screaming, that's not my daughter, trying to pry the elevator doors open as we're going up nine floors. And I was pulled off of the elevator doors, screaming and, and ranting and raving. And we finally get to the ninth floor and I'm putting to, put into a 10 by 10 room with no phone, no window, no connection to the outside world. And the walls are closing in and I'm, I'm, I'm about done. And they finally, the, the trauma or the social worker leaves and brings a trauma surgeon in and the trauma surgeon is the one who had to tell me what had happened to Christy. And he, he, he was just beside himself because he's having to explain to the mother mm -hmm. what happened to this 14 year old girl. And it was devastating to him as much as it was to me. So what did, what did I mean, okay, so I'm sure he gave you the details of everything of what was going on. At that time, you know, um, did they anticipate that she was going to be okay or did they think she was going to be a vegetable? I mean, what, what happened? Because she had a lot, of, a lot of injuries. She did. He told me that she would likely not survive the next 24 hours. I'm sorry, what did you say? She would not likely survive the next 24 hours. Okay. She'd been stabbed twice in the stomach. She had, both of her wrists had been cut and bound. Um, 
She'd been strangled with her shoestrings, and her sla throat had been slashed repeatedly. And they thought her esophagus and vocal cords had been severed. They also thought her spinal cord was severed in two places. So if she does sort of somehow miraculously, miraculously survive the, the surgery, she will likely never walk or talk again. And if she survives the next 24 hours after the surgery. So I wasn't held in any hope that she would survive. All I could do was pray. Did they let you see her? About 11 o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. So we got to the hospital around 8.39, and I was finally able to see her around 9, 11 o'clock. And the nurse came out and got me, and she said, we need you to go in and hold her hand and tell her everything's going to be okay, even though she's unconscious. I, I, I remember looking at her, and I said, you, you need to tell me how to do that. I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. And I walked into her ICU room, and it's dark but dimly lit, and I hear this whoosh sound. And I, I can still hear that sound in my head, and it just drives me crazy every time I walk into a hospital and hear that. That was the breathing machine breathing for yeah. her. And as soon as I walked into her room, I collapsed on the floor, and they said I just started wailing, which I don't remember, and they carried me out to the end of the hall and stood me up against the wall and said, you need to get yourself under control and go in there and be there for your daughter. <laughs> I, I like still haven't figured they... out, you know, how I'm supposed to do this. Yeah, I like um, the way they just say that, like... It's common, you know, this is a common uh, effect that people go through and you need to get yourself together and go in there and do what you need to do for, as, as a mom. It's like, I, I don't even know how to speak to you right now, much less console my daughter who's unconscious and I don't know if she's gonna live. Oh my gosh, and were you by yourself? Was, was Bob? Bobby was with me, but okay. he, I don't remember him saying and doing anything. He was in such shock, having found the girls at, at the house and um, calling 911, trying to get help. He was a total basket case. Did he end up getting therapy? No, and to this day he has not gotten any. And I, I know that sounds like a, a far cry from what we're actually talking about, but um, is it secondary, ad, no, what is it, adverse trauma? What is it called, the secondary trauma? Yes. What, what is it, is it just I, secondary trauma? I think or? it is, I think that's close enough. To what... So even though he wasn't like the immediate victim if you witness something like that, or you're a part of that, or someone that you love um, goes through through trauma, then you too can be affected by trauma and should probably get get some find somebody to talk to. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't want to say get help, but find somebody to talk to because everyone's outlet is different. Um, so, so all of this is is why you launched the Stacy Foundation to train people. Yes. Right. How long after? How long after it happened did you decide to launch the organization? Well, we, we started in 2001, around August, around Stacy's birthday, and I had been speaking since Christy had, got, had been released from the hospital. So it was evident that it, there, something needed to be done. You'd been speaking? Mm -hmm. you, were, you were out publicly speaking mm -hmm. about it while she was still in the hospital? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. How our... did you muster the, I mean, how, how could you just talk about it, or were you talking about the circumstances um, with the officers and the clergy member not even being skilled enough to help you through the process? What were you talking about when you were speaking? That was part of it. I went to the, uh, the middle school where Christy was a student um, and spoke to about 200 students because they became terrified of being latchkey kids like the girls were, mm -hmm. and they believed that that same monster was living in their house, and they were terrified to go home. Um, the parents were having difficulty with their kids not being able to share the emotions that they were experiencing. And having understood that, because I didn't know how to relay my emotions to the police officers or the chaplain or the hospital staff, mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand the emotions I was experiencing. How are these young kids going to understand that? Right. And so we went to the school, we spoke to the, to the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and I, I barely remember even being there, much less what I said, but I stood up there and talked to them for two hours and oh told them, you know, you need to find somebody to talk to. If it's not a parent, you know, a teacher, somebody you can trust because you've got to get this out. You can't keep burying it and stuffing it. And this and is if they had been victimized, if someone had been stalking them or had they had been sexually right. violated or something to that right. degree. Okay. And even, you know, just being home alone with this crazy man running around killing, the, you know, students in their school, it terrified them. And so after I spoke to the students, the next day I got tons and tons of phone calls at the hospital thanking me and I'm like, I don't even know what I said. Mm -hmm. So it must have been something positive. 
but I just knew I had to reach out to those kids and reassure them that everything was okay. How long after it happened was he caught? How long did it take for them to get him? They captured him about six, seven hours later. Hours? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, okay, good. Yeah, Christy was able to, to tell them. Um, oh, she could speak. She could speak, but see, the doctor didn't know this when he, when he informed me, but her voice was very, very raspy and extremely low, so it was like a whisper, a mm -hmm. very hoarse whisper. But one of the officers was able to determine who the, who the perpetrator was Great. and immediately put out an APB on him and they, they captured him about six or seven hours later. Oh my gosh. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to give everything away. I know. Um, but okay. So this is Lorraine's new book. And, um, I was crazy excited when, when she, um, sent out her press release. It's like I messaged her immediately like, oh my gosh, you've got to come back to the show. You have to come back. Um, this is Heal My Wounds, um, Keep My Scars. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my bad. Leave my scars. And I actually just made that comment to um, someone last evening. I was talking to a young girl who used to do self-harming. Mm. She used to cut. And she was showing me. Um, she was like, look, you know, they're 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 almost gone to me they weren't almost gone i could still see the mm. the scars vividly and i was like so heal your wounds leave your, leave your scars and she's like yes she was like i don't ever want them to go away because it's a reminder of you know where i was in my life at that time and how far i've come wow so i was mm -hmm. um i was really happy to hear that from her you know who she is and we'll we can talk about it sure. later but um when she said that it, it really touched me because when we first connected with her, she was not in a very good place at mm. all. Not in a good place at all. So this book um, is is out because I'm holding it in my hand. Um, where can we find it? Because we're going to talk. Some, I want to talk about the perpetrator. Yes. When we come back, I want to talk about the perpetrator when we come back. But we're going to take a break. Um, a little lighten things up a little bit. We have a young lady coming to the microphone, um, and she's going to share her gift of music, of song and she's actually a survivor. So when we come back to talk to Lorraine, we're gonna talk more about her brand new book, Hot Off the Presses, Heal My Wounds, Leave My Scars. So right now, can um, I would love for our musical guest, Can Suela, to make, make her way to the microphone. Now, you've not heard me say this name before. However, um, behind, the cam behind the camera. Um, okay, okay. Uh, you've not heard me say her name before, however, <laughs> She was actually a guest on um, during the session, the healing session, the survivor session. And the interesting thing was Consuela did not reach out to me originally. Her husband inboxed me through the Cassie Project um, Facebook and inboxed me. And he's like, you have to talk to my wife. You have to talk to my wife. You know, she really needs this. She needs this. And I'm like, okay. So I think I was like, either give her my number or have her call me or blah, blah, blah. And the thing was, before, before she and I could even connect good, he was inboxing me back like, well, did you talk to her? Did you talk to my <laughs> wife? What, what happened? Did you, you know? And I'm like, dude, I had actually just gotten off the phone with her when I got his message. And I'm like, dude, I just talked to her. Yeah, you know, we're making arrangements. We're making arrangements. But I love that because as a survivor, it is so important for us to find a partner in life, a life partner, a soulmate, whatever you want to call it, but to find someone who is willing to take that journey with you. Um, if you are a survivor and you haven't started healing and you have all those triggers and all those issues that guys like to say, oh, she crazy, she crazy. We're not crazy, we're just not healed, you know? So to find someone who cares enough about you to contact an organization on your behalf um, and, and inbox and text them every day about whether or not, about whether or not, you know, you and their partner have connected. That's, that's huge and it's very commendable. So thank you, hubby. Thank you, hubby, who happens to be in the studio with us. So <laughs> I am going to turn things over to our musical guest, Miss Consuela Coates and accompaniment, her, her background singer.
Autograph CD. Yeah. She gave yes, me an yes, yes, yes. autograph CD. Uh, <laughs> um, so, what's it called? That's on my new CD, um, The Next Level. The Next and Level. That's a song that I wrote. It was just um, a part of some of my healing process. Just it was very cathartic for me just to write, you know, and that helped me a lot with my music. To okay. Be able to uh, to heal what I went through. So. so, tell me how. Um, well, we know how you found the Cassie Project, mm -hmm. but you know, it's all up to the survivor to say, hey, I'm ready to do this, I want to do this. Right. How long have you been out of your situation? Um, let's see, um, it's been well over 20, 20 mm. some odd years. Okay. It's been over 20 some odd years. Um, what started with me was when I was a little girl at age seven, um, when my mother got married after my father died. Um, and then uh, in my marriage is when I, you know, heard the uh, domestic violence uh, thing that was mentally and uh, physically. But um, yeah, it's been over twenty some five years. Okay. But, uh, I'm 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 starting to heal. Okay. I'm all right. All right. Thank God for that. Amen. I know, right? Thank God for that. Yes. So I'm very yes. grateful yes. for you coming out. Yes. Thank you so much for yeah, having me. Yeah, yeah, of I course, of course. The project. I believe in it with my whole Come heart, over here for me. And it's just something that I really want to be involved in. Okay, I just want you to get a little bit closer because I don't think that mic is picking up all of these wonderful words that you're saying. Oh. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure, so maybe if you can kind of just like yell in my direction, not yell, oh, but okay. I'm just all kidding. Right. Um, okay. But I, I do want to thank you for that. And your story will be up soon. Uh, actually, Consuela, I love saying her name. That is just so pretty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Consuela's uh, journey will be up on the Cassie Project website. And so keep watching our Facebook page, Facebook backslash the Cassie Project, for, um, for more uploads and Lorraine's journey. You know what? I'm going to try to find your journey from years ago when you came and you shared on the couch. But Consuela, I applaud you. That was an amazing song. I love it. Am I allowed Thank to use you. it at you all? Are. For, yeah, yes, I love you that. Are. And I love so much when you all were speaking and you kept saying journey. Mm -hmm. You kept, you know, and I was like, that's that's what we're on. This Absolutely, is, this is our journey. Absolutely, good and bad, but it just it all makes up our journey. Yeah, yeah. I learn a lot along the way. Sometimes I say um, stories and things like that, but the more I talk with um, people who who work to heal others. I learned the terminology, things that I, I should say more and less of and, and things like that. So right. I'm glad that made a difference because that too is 
the name of your song. Yeah, it and it makes a difference because this is our journey and this is what we are sharing. So thank you, Consuela. Thank you for having me. You thank are you more than welcome. So All righty. And you know what? Can you sign the couch for me before you go? Sure. This is this is a different couch than the one that you yeah, shared on. Ready to sing. I know this one is a different one. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> anywhere you like. Yes, yes, yes. So this is what we do. Survivors actually come out and they say, I'm ready to start sharing. They contact me and we find a safe place. Consuela decided to share during a survivor session, which I'm very thankful for. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you a kiss later. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was um, Consuela Coates. She has a project out and she is a survivor. She's a great survivor. You should hear her story, she, her journey. She had us cracking up and crying all at the same time, mm -hmm. all at the same time. So back with Lorraine Hooberry, who actually has a new book out. She's had this organization called the Stacy Foundation for, is it like, fifth, wait a minute, because it was 13 when you started helping me. So mm -hmm. how many years? It's been 17 years. 17 years. The Stacy Foundation has been around for 17 years, and you guys go to prisons. Mm -hmm. um, you do a lot of prison ministry, mm -hmm. and you travel all across the country to yes. speak about your journey, your story, this book, um, basically, which is all in here. So how's that been received? You go to... Um, the prisons, how do the prisoners receive you? It's amazing to watch God's transformation right there in front of your eyes because these are big, burly men who have committed some heinous crimes. Mm -hmm. And one particular, I have to share this with you, one particular young man came up to me um, last month. We were at Foothills Correctional in South North Carolina, mm -hmm. and he, we were at a three-day weekend with these young men who are the Bloods and the Crips. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Technical and difficulties. He has decided to leave the, the gang member membership and become a um, um, child of God. He has accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. He's in yes. Bible studies. He's 20 years old and he's made this decision with a huge target on his back because now it's not cool when you leave a gang yeah. and when you're committed as deeply as he is. So he's got a lot of trials and tribulations ahead of him, mm -hmm. but we're praying for him, praying for him, praying for him. And this is why I go into the prisons because God can use us anywhere we go. And true. if that's where he's sending us, that's where we'll go. This is true. Mm -hmm. I've actually um, found an affinity for going to the prisons as well. It's like when you think about going up to the prison and you're talking to people who have done some, some terrible things, it's like you're expecting to see a bunch of monsters. Yeah. I don't see a bunch of monsters, you know, and having conversations with them like a normal like you would normally have if you ran into somebody on the street or things right. like that. The support that you get from um, some of the prisoners, like I've told you before, GCI is a huge supporter of the Cassie Project. Um, and, you know, they send mail, they keep in touch, they invite us up frequently to do the same piece <laughs> over and over again. But um, there's, there's a rotation, so, you know, not everyone has seen it. But I love working in the prisons. I really do. I love giving them an opportunity for atonement, too. Yes. Because I think that was the question that I asked when we, um, when we went to the prison the first time. If you, could, if you could apologize to your victim, what would you say? Or if there was an opportunity for you to apologize, would you do it? I think that right. was it. If there was an opportunity, would you do it? And several of them said yes until dude started talking about Tony, and then I got emotional. And blah, blah, blah. But anyway, <laughs> so speaking of Tony perpetrators and prison, mm -hmm. let's talk about uh, the, the guy who attacked your girls. So what happened with him? Well, he was captured about six or seven hours after the attack, mm -hmm. um, trying to leave town, trying to hide. He wouldn't confess to the crimes. He was confessing to all the burglaries he had been doing in the past, for the past two weeks, and that wasn't even on their radar. So they used that as leverage to kind of convert Shot himself in the foot. With that yes, one. he did. Yeah. Absolutely. And they finally got a confession out of him against Stacy, but he wouldn't confess to the sexual assault or the crime against Christy. So we had to go to trial. A year and a half later, we went to trial. He came in with this cocky attitude that just ripped through me like glass and thought, him, thought of himself as God and was telling the media that he was God, that he was invincible, what? they couldn't do anything to him, he was going to get off, they couldn't, they couldn't um, confirm anything that he had done. And we had the DNA, we had Christie's testimony, we had it all. And we went to trial, he was found guilty of capital murder and Good. convicted of the death penalty in the state of Virginia, which is a high death uh, penalty state. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we thought we had it nailed. And then two years later, we got the call that 
the, the Virginia Supreme Court overruled the death penalty conviction for Stacy's murder, and we went back to trial. I was why? Did they say why? I mean, because they saw it as two separate cases. But he never left the house. He killed Stacy and then waited two hours for Christy to come home and then attacked her. And the Virginia Supreme Court saw it as double jeopardy, and it wasn't. No, because it's two different people. <laughs> exactly. And, but he never left. He didn't leave and come back. He stayed. He was there for, yeah. for in my home for over three hours. I don't, well, yeah. I don't understand that. I know I've seen the movie Double Jeopardy, and you can't try someone twice for the same crime, mm -hmm. but it was two different people. Mm -hmm. So, okay, 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 and then what happened? Well, again, he shot himself in the foot because he thought he was only going to get life in prison. He wrote a, a devastating, convicting letter telling us everything we couldn't prove in the first trial, and so he used that as leverage against him, went back to trial, retried him, and he was found guilty of capital murder and reconvicted for the death penalty. So he was a genius. Yes, he was. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, that was very hard for Christy because she had to testify again, mm -hmm. and that really set her back, a huge, huge setback for her. She was a senior in high school and almost didn't graduate. We had to bring in homeschoolers that homeschooled her, and as soon as she graduated, she fled, and for about two years, I didn't know if she was dead or alive. She fled? She fled. She was highly involved in drugs and alcohol and some other promiscuous things that... Uh-huh, as a result, yes, yes. side effects of, of having been a victim. Yeah. And not knowing how to deal with all this. Her sister's been murdered. She's been sexually assaulted and tried. the man tried to kill her. And he just was blatantly sending us nasty letters trying to have Christy killed from prison so she wouldn't testify what? again. I don't it think I knew about that part. Lorraine. awful. Oh, my goodness. I was constantly in the, in the prosecutor's office yelling and screaming about something that he was doing. And it was just, he made our life a living hell. He really did. And so with what you just told me, because I didn't know about him writing nasty letters and, and put, trying to put a hit on Christy, I mean, and then to get to the, not the end of your story, but as we move further mm -hmm. into to this story, it's like, really, Lorraine, how did, how did you do that? And you guys are like, what are you talking about? Well, she's going to tell us. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I want to know about the interaction. You had an opportunity to interact with him prior to um, his official demise, I right. you can say, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how did it come about? Did he come about? Did he want to see you? Did you want to see him? How did you make that happen? I and why did you make that happen? I wanted to see him. And from the very beginning, we fought for every right we had and then some. We didn't have a lot, but I fought for everything. And I wanted to see him before he was executed. I wanted to sit face to face with him, ask him questions. Why did you do this? What provoked you? Why couldn't you have just walked away? Yeah. You know, the whys, the hows. Mm -hmm. And he finally agreed that he, would, he wanted to meet with me too. But how I, long did the process take? How long did it take before he agreed? Not even the process. Um, before he agreed to do it, how long did that take? It took about two years. So at this point, he had been... Actually, it took longer than that. I'm sorry. It took about seven years. Oh, wow. Well, so he'd been incarcerated for how long? He was incarcerated a total of 11 years. Okay. And he didn't get locked up until after, what, three years or four years after he murdered the girls? Oh, no. He was locked up right away. Okay. But he didn't go to prison until after the first trial. So it was a year and a half later. Okay. Okay, yeah. a year and a half later. Yeah. I'm sorry, so go ahead. That's so right. you wanted to sit across from him mm -hmm. and ask him the questions, the whys, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how did that work out? It didn't. <laughs> we met roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. The warden wouldn't allow it. The state wouldn't allow it. The prosecutor wouldn't allow it. The attorney general wouldn't allow it. They Why? kept saying because he could hurt you further. What more can he do to me that he hasn't already done? What more can he take away that he hasn't already taken? And it just infuriated me that I didn't have the right to control what I wanted. And it, it just kept prying and, and pushing and, and asking and getting doors slammed in my face, getting phones unanswered, calls, letters unanswered. And I just kept pushing and pushing. So has Stacy been able to, to change any of those laws? We have. Yay. We have. Yay. Okay, yes. okay. So you pushed and pushed and pushed until you got what you wanted. And then what happened? Well, we didn't get face to face, but we did get a phone call with him the day before his execution sitting in his attorney's office. We had okay. a three-hour phone call with Paul Powell, and I finally got to ask him the questions that I wanted to ask, but I couldn't see him because I wanted to read his body language. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see him eye to eye. I wanted yeah. him to see me yeah. eye to eye. And the only time we had that con connection was in the courtroom, and he wouldn't look at me but a split second, and then he was, his eyes were down the whole time. But the body language spoke volumes. 
What'd he say, Lorraine? He didn't say anything. No, when you're on the phone call. Oh, on the phone call. Sorry, uh, yes. <laughs> you're switching back and forth. Come on, Graham. Come on now. <laughs> just, just tell us what's happening. Come on. Okay. Well, we were on the phone for about three, well, an hour and a half at the beginning, mm -hmm. and I didn't say anything. My sister was mediating the call. We found out he'd become a Christian. I was struggling with this because I, I, with everything that he had shown and done, it was really hard to accept this. Yes. But I started believing and hearing the Holy Spirit saying, he's, he's, he's accepted me. He is a son of God. He is my child, just as some as you are. Yeah. And That's so hard. This is true. And I'm thinking, That's okay. so hard. Okay, Lord, then show me. You're telling me, show me. Mm -hmm. And he started telling us about his journey of becoming a Christian and how a chaplain came to his death row cells and would minister to him. And he finally accepted Christ. And I, be, I knew in my heart at that moment he was telling the truth. He really, he really had been saved. And I knew that um, God had worked a miracle not only in my life but in his too because I forgave him two years before we had this meeting. And I had written him a letter because the Lord told me to, even though I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, you know, you need to write him a letter and tell him this. And I said, no, he doesn't need to know. He said, the Lord said, yes, he does. And so we had that conversation over the phone. And finally I said to Paul, I said, you know, I understand that you received my letter and that I've forgiven you, but I wanted to tell you face to face and the best I can do is over this phone call. He said, yes, and I can't believe you forgave me. And I said, well... You need to understand that when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you become a child of God the same as me. And you deserve exactly what I have, and that's forgiveness. And he, he just started crying. He says, I, I just can't believe you forgave me. And I said, well, I have, but I haven't heard you say you've forgiven yourself. And yeah. he got very adamant. He says, no, I can't do that. And I said, but you can. It's, you're, you're, you give yourself permission. It's okay to forgive yourself. You've accepted Christ. You've been forgiven. But he just kept saying he couldn't do it. And I remember saying, saying to him, I went in there with all these questions I wanted to ask, and I didn't write them down because I thought I could remember them. Yeah. Every question in my mind went blank. And I'm like, oh. I couldn't speak. And I hear myself saying all of a sudden, Paul, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for your family. And I want you to know we're going to pray you through the execution. And it went totally silent. And I said, Paul, are you there? And he said, yes. I can't believe you're praying for me. And I still get goosebumps when I think about it. And I said, Paul, the Lord drove me to my knees to pray for you because I had a heart of stone that I couldn't, I couldn't change. And I asked God to give me a heart of flesh to see you as he saw you. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't see you that way. I saw you as this ugly monster that oh, came yeah. into my house yeah. and destroyed my family. He said, Lorraine, that's who I was. But that's not who I am now. And I said, I believe that. And we're going to pray you through this execution because tomorrow night you're going to be executed by the state of Virginia and you're going to stand face to face with your creator. And what are you going to say? I, I can't even imagine. You know, he, being he, he didn't in know position. either. I don't want to be in that position. I'm just saying. And I said, Paul, I, I, I know that Christ is going to take you the minute you pass from this life to the next and you're going to be in his arms. And then I hear myself saying, and Stacy's going to be there to welcome you home. And I'm thinking to myself, I did not just say that. <laughs> but I knew I had, and I knew the Holy Spirit was speaking. And I said, Paul, I'll see you when I get there. And the phone call automatically shut off. We have no more connection with him. And I'm sitting there in this, this stunned state thinking, yeah, that's how it's going to be. This is it. This is what I've been waiting for. And the next night, I find myself at, we find ourselves at the prison. I'm standing outside the death chamber. Oh my God. <laughs> this metal building that has no significance whatsoever except what, you know, what waits us inside. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing there, my feet are planted, I can't move, I can't breathe, and my daughter walks up beside me and she says, Mom, we've come this far, you've been by my side the whole time, we're gonna do this together. And I told her from the beginning, I will be there for you forever. And I suddenly I can't move. And the stench coming from this room is oh horrible. So the electricity's in the air. Oh. The hair on my neck is standing up. It's, it's awful. And I, I know what awaits us. But I can't. I'm very visual. I couldn't picture what I was going to experience. Finally, you got to see him? Yes. Oh, my goodness. We witnessed the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. I thought yeah. you were just kind of like outside waiting. Like No, my feet <laughs> didn't want to move. But my mind's saying walk. 
we finally cross the threshold, and as we go into this very dark room, you can't see your hand in front of your face, the door slams, it's nine o'clock at night, the door slams behind us, scares me to death, I about jumped out of my skin, and we slowly walk forward because there's light filtering through what looks like might be a window in front of us, and as we walk up, the blinds slowly begin to open, and there's this white, stark room with a solitary wooden chair, and a window beside it and a clock above it. And a media room is off to the left. There's 50 witnesses in this media room. And I hear him say, uh, the, the warden said, they're gonna be walking him out soon. I hear voices and there's a metal door between us and they're reading him his last rites, the chaplain's reading him his last rites. And the, you hear the chains rattling, they're shackling him and slowly he comes walking out and he takes a chair with every ounce of dignity he had. And one of the prayers that I've been praying um, ever since I was able to forgive him was that God would give him a portal hole to that one-way mirror that we would be standing behind, mm -hmm. even though I didn't want to be behind that mirror. I wanted to be on the other side where he could see me and I could see him and mm -hmm. there would be no roadblocks or obstacles. And I knew that wasn't gonna happen. And I said, Lord, please give him a portal hole into that one-way mirror so he can see us as we see him. And as we're strapping him in the chair, he's looking directly at us. And I knew God opened that mirror, and he saw us. And then they went through the process, and it was the most horrific thing besides putting my daughter in a casket at the age of 16 and saying goodbye, watching that young man die, but knowing in my heart he's in God's hands. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of that and more is in this book. Mm. The trainings that you've given to the, um, the, the police departments, the mm. trainings that you've given clergy member, yes. you, you had to talk with them as well. Yes. Um, if you have ever lost a child to domestic violence or sexual abuse or any type of violence, just the story of forgiveness alone is worth reading this book. Um, Lorraine, you always, you always take me there. You always take me there. And I am so glad that, you know, you are able to come back. And I, I haven't, turn around, did you see Cassie behind you? Yes, I did, that's awesome. So, um, if, as you all may know that I usually bring one of the girls, we call them the girls, the red ladies, into the studio. And the first one that I saw was of Stacy. Um, Lorraine's daughter. And these silhouettes are complements of um, Silence No More, and they create these silhouettes in honor of victims of domestic violence, of which Cassie was, and so was Stacy. And as you can see, Cassie was pregnant. The silhouette has her belly and the baby story, and then her story on the placard on her chest. And at some point during our journey as we were doing the Cassie Project, well, this one actually was sponsored. They're each sponsored by someone or an organization. The Stacy Foundation sponsored this particular silhouette of, of Cassie. And then Cassie's mom and Lorraine surprised me <laughs> with my very own silhouette of, of Cassandra so that I could have her to go with me everywhere whenever I share her story and my journey and, and our journey um, through healing. She's no longer here, but I can still speak for her. She's, she's helping me heal along the Absolutely. way. So um, before we get out of here, because we are, we are wrapping up, um, I definitely want you to sign the new couch and my book. <laughs> this is my copy. Yes, it is. So I'm going to bring a copy. Well, not to you. Well, maybe to you. I don't know. I should bring a copy to you, too. Thriving Fearlessly, Women Thriving Fearlessly, Volume 3. It's the book that I did, which I promised we'd switch off. It's in the car. Okay. But... <laughs> Before you go, please yes. put your signature on yes, our, yes. this is our fourth couch since we launched the Cassie Project. Um, the other three are full of signatures, and so I'm very um, happy and sad at the same time to say that we've generated uh, that much support and that much healing for survivors and supporters of sexual and domestic abuse. Oh, she got fancy on that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. The CassieProject.org is our website. If you ever think you're ready to share and you want to share publicly, you can actually um, hit us up on the website and say, hey, Chris, I'm ready. And I'll say, hey, what's your safe place? And you'll say, I want to do it on TV. Or I want to be a part of the Survivor Sessions. Or 
you're more than welcome to ask for a one-on-one -on -one where I bring the couch to you, wherever it may be, Fountain Square, the Purple People Bridge, wherever, Joseph Beth Bookstore, like uh, Sheila Mudbaker. Um, so thank you so much for all of your support and all of this time. Lorraine, I need a kiss. Absolutely. I can't wait to um, reconnect because you've done so many things. The things that we didn't even talk about when you had your house, oh goodness, what was the name of it? The Hope House. Oh, the Wings of Hope Crisis Center. The Wings of Hope Crisis Center. The Wings of Hope Crisis Center. Are we reopening that? We've opened actually as a uh, Sharing Hope Center. Oh, okay. Yes. Wait a minute. Is that, we did That's, is that where we did track? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Give everybody the address. Uh, the Sharing Hope Center. 10461 Pippin Road in Coleraine, Ohio. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a plan. And if you want this book, just visit the Cassie website. Um, you're going to give me a link yes. to purchase the book. Um, that would be wonderful. Am I supposed to say that? To get the book for a donation. Is that better? <laughs> this is community TV, I'm just saying. So Lorraine Huberry has been my guest. Consuela Coates has also been here. Um, it's been wonderful hearing it again, hearing new things. I'm not really sure how I feel about that. But, you know, the truth is the truth. It's your truth and it's your journey. So I can't change it, but I'm just grateful that you and Christy are here. So we're going to leave that. Did you want to share what, what's going on with Christy real quick or you want to save it for the book? I'll tell you. Okay, what, what, <laughs> what, what, what? what? Well, when Christy was in the hospital, they told us she would never have children. We have two grandbabies. Hey! <laughs> two and three. Yes. One of which, are, are they both coming up to be with you? For uh, just the, just Kesley, the three, okay. my granddaughter. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's wonderful. See how God works. Yeah. There's nothing that he cannot do. Amen. So please remember that without him, we are nothing. But with him, we can do all things as they turn the music over while I'm talking. But it's okay. That's what happens. <laughs> See you next time on Cassie Live. <laughs> 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 <laughs>